so uh, we uh, went through rule of three. We had a string as an example, and in that string, what we created was <coughs> uh, a class with multiple operator overloads. We explained that operator overloads <coughs> that our member can never have two arguments. Don't make that mistake. <coughs> Uh, we said that we want to always avoid uh, having a friend method. As a matter of fact, I believe it's absolutely uh, unnecessary to have a friend method. If you have a method, it's, uh, if you, you, you shouldn't have a friend function. A friend function is simply a method being called in an outside thing, so you don't need to make it a friend. And uh, we talked about uh, the standard way of displaying, the standard way of reading, rule of three, copy constructor, copy assignment, and destructor uh, to make uh, copying and passing objects in any case successful. <clears throat> we talked about index operators and how you can overload, an oper uh, overload a function only by <clears throat> its uh, access to the class and return value that they have. So you can actually, if so, that whatever comes after takes part in the signature of the function. As you see, these two functions are identical. The only difference is that one will not change the object, the other one will. You do that so if you want that functionality to be accessible even if the object is read only. So if you pass an object as a constant value to a, to a function, <clears throat> making the uh, method constant, make it available. All the non-constant functionalities of a function, when passed as a constant value, will not be available. You cannot use them. And I demonstrated by <clears throat> having a function that receives a constant string reference, and in here, the operator that is, access is, ac that is uh, uh, accessed by the by the function is the one that is constant because the reference is constant and that's what we have done. So far, we, when, we went through, when we go through all these things, we understand how internally an object works and how we can actually set up an object to make it safe with dynamic memory allocation, any type of memory usage and all the good stuff. All those people who have laptops, pay attention to the lecture, not to your laptops, please. We are just switching towards extremely important topic, which is called inheritance. For that, I created, as I said, an animal kingdom. So, so now we are dealing with a class called animal. What is an animal? Yeah, uh, I know that many of you haven't seen the feedback to your uh, to your test, it is open. You can go home, do it, and book an appointment, and we'll talk about whatever you think it's, is important. <clears throat> so, I created the class called Animal to what encapsulates me as an animal. And this animal class of mine is something like this. So, uh, it is just an example. It doesn't have to be perfectly good. <laughs> so, I'm saying an animal is something that has a name and uh, it can act, move, and make a sound, okay? So like a cat can be uh, playful, uh, the cat can uh, jump around, and the cat can say meow. Um, a dog is um, acting intelligently, it uh, walks around, it runs, and it goes woof woof, okay? So things like that, so whatever. So I can create an animal like this. Just to begin to, to remind us of what we have over here, I created an accessor, <clears throat> a query, uh, a getter, and a modifier, or a setter, or what we call a mutator, right? So these are, so th this one sets the name, this one gets the name, and we have uh, no dynamic memory allocation to talk about only uh, inheritance. So this is my animal. The rule of three will be removed for the next stuff. It's just for this one to just remember what we have done. So the first example that I have animal, I have a copy construct and a copy assignment, so we can play with it and see how everything is done in there. And uh, in my main, I create an animal. 
I call the one argument constructor. Again, I remind you this is a one argument constructor. I am setting the debugging to true so I can see the messages. So this is one argument constructor. OK? And I create the animal, and I make it act, move, and make a sound. And uh, what is act and move and make a sound? Uh, an animal. acts like an animal, moves like an animal, and sounds like an animal. Simple, right? That's why I have three methods, and each one is doing something like that. Very simple example to see how things work. Obviously, I created the rule of three, so we can, you can turn it on and off in the example and see how it behaves in, to remind us what we have learned so far. Again, next examples of animal, the rule of three is removed because we want to concentrate on inheritance. So if I run the program now, we will see that it's going to show an animal. And as you see, the animal is being passed by a constant reference over there. Uh, so when I uh, run the program, this is just making the stage ready. to learn about inheritance, OK? So uh, I create uh, Fluffy the animal, OK? Then it acts like an animal, moves like an animal, sounds like an animal. Then I say show animal A goes over here. As we have talked about it many times before, when you pass, when a function is called, the function call happens like this. So essentially, the function up here is called as follows. So the argument of the functions is initialized by the value of the value that is passed to it. That's how a function is called. So when you are calling a function, passing an argument to it, it's as if you are saying show animal and you are setting that argument to that value. So essentially this gets initialized by that. Because it's a reference, it means x becomes a new name for a. We know that. x becomes a new name for a. And it comes up over here. So when I say x dot name, it, it is actually a dot name. Therefore, it is going to say showing fluffy, right? And then it returns the reference out. If I, if I wanted to use that reference for something, it would have used it. But because I didn't capture that reference, it goes to cyberspace. Nobody's using it. A function may return something that you never use. You experienced that 55,000 times in IPC 144 when you called printf. Who knows what printf returns? What is that integer? The number of characters printed. So when return value of printf is number of characters printed on the screen. Well, we never knew that. Scanf returns something. What does it return? The number of items read. So the ampersands you have in the format string, that's the number of returns, which one of them. So if you have three of them and all three are read, it returns three. If it's successful only in two and the third one cannot be read, it returns two. If it returns zero, it means it didn't read anything. If it returns minus one, it means it hits end of file. So these are the things that but we never use it. It's the same thing. We never use it because we didn't know what it does. But now, uh, in here, we are experiencing that, that this is returning an animal reference, which I'm not using. There is no shame in that. Are we OK with this? Then we are reaching to the end of main. And after the end of main, obviously, the destructor is called, which is removing Fluffy the animal. Right? Right before every, uh, the animal goes out of, spo uh, uh, out of scope and dies. Are we OK with this? Are we OK? Now, to see what copy constructor and copy assignment and all these things are, this is what I'm going to do. OK? I didn't do anything. It just returns the reference by value, which means it has, when I say by value, it means the name is not returned. <clears throat> it gets the x, and it says return it by value. Anything returned by value 
cannot be returned from one scope to another. It's a force field. You cannot pass through it. To do that, you have to make a copy and you have to pass the copy. So just by doing that, although it is not being used, take a look at here. You see what happens over there? Creating act move sound, showing Fafi, removing Fafi, and we are done, right? I'm just going to run it quickly so you see I'm not going to walk through it. So if I run the exact same thing, just <clears throat> the only thing I did over there, but take a look now. I'm not doing anything, but right before the return, so it's showing, showing Fluffy. At the end of that one, when it returns X, it copies it into another class of type animal to return it out. Then it's, uh, and setting it to whatever Fluffy is, after the return at line 17.5, it kills it because it's not used. Anything nameless is doomed to die at the end of the statement, which is uh, that thing is in, because it's not used anymore. So that dies, then it goes to end of main, and then it goes. So passing stuff by value is not fun. Exact same thing over here. If I actually do it like this, it looks like it works the same, but when you run it, you will see again many copying or added to it because it keeps adding copy. Now this is changed to, so the function call will change to this. So I have animal x equal to a, that's a call to one argument constructor. That one argument constructor is building x animal out of another animal, which means it's a copy constructor. So now the copy constructor is called, and it, become, uh, it becomes more expensive. That's why we always pass stuff by reference. Good review? Done? OK. So now we know what an animal is. Now please clear your mind of all the copy construction and stuff. We don't care about that anymore. All we need to do, we need to learn, is an animal acts, animal moves, and animal makes a sound. Are we OK with this? Now I have a cat. Cat is an animal, right? Cat does not have an animal. I cannot say cat has an animal. That's wrong. Cat is an animal. I can have an animal. I have a dog, OK? I am not a dog. I have a dog, right? <laughs> right? So I, it, I want you to just, because that, essentially, we call it a use case. When you study uh, object-oriented design, system analysis and design. They write a use case, and you do all the is a's become inheritance, all the has a become property. So far that has a dog, it means I have a property, I have an attribute that is dog, I have a dog. Far that has eyes, far that has a head, these are my attributes. But far that is a human, hopefully, okay, which means now I'm inheriting everything from humanity. Are we okay with this? Do we understand this? Okay, so <clears throat> cat is an animal. How do I implement that? How do I make a cat an animal? The animal remains the same. <clears throat> As I told you, I removed all the, <clears throat> all the uh, copy construction, copy assignment. I left the destructor because we need it for future. <clears throat> but that's what that's my animal is. Now, if I have an animal and I want to create a cat out of it, I'm not going to start to reinvent the wheel from the beginning because I know a cat is an animal. It has everything that an animal has. Therefore, when I'm designing a cat, I'm going to say cat is an animal. Public means is. So I'm saying class cat, public animal. It means anything animal has now goes to cat. Cat has it. It doesn't need to implement it. <clears throat> As you see, I don't have name. But something cat has that other animals don't, and that's number of lives. Right? It has nine lives, they say. <laughs> Part
Oh, yeah, why we are saying public in here? <clears throat> there are three ways you can do inheritance. Public, protected, private. Yeah, but protected, private, too rich for our blood. So in our vocabulary, public is the only thing we can do, right? So assume that they don't exist because it's, it's, it goes to the philosophy of inheritance. I don't want to go through it. What does it mean to publicly inherit something or privately? For now, we just inherit, okay? So cat is an animal that has number of lives. It means cat, what happened? Everything's good? Suddenly everybody looked back. Let me look. Are we okay? All right. So cat is an animal that has number of lives. It means, do I need to add a name to that? No. Name comes from the animal. I don't need to access it. I don't need to add it. If animal has a name, it means cat will have a name. I don't need to worry about that. <clears throat> Then I create constructors. So what I do, I'll go cat, default constructors, put it in a safe empty state, or I can create a cat, pass a name, so the animal part of the cat can get the name, number of lives, so the cat part of the thing can get the, uh, get the number of lives. <clears throat> now, all those things that I want to change from parent, I can, Confusing, overwrite, <clears throat> we know overload. This is override. Overload means same function, different, different, different action, different attributes. So they are not same function. They are actually two different functions with same name. Override means identical function. This shadows the parent's act. My father actually used to be a teacher. It's a bad analogy because <clears throat> I cannot say I inherited from my father because in object-oriented world, my father and I <clears throat> are both instances of a male human. So I cannot be inheriting anything from my father as one object cannot. And I, am, I cannot say I inherit from my mother. My mother is a, a female human. So the correct terminology is that my mother has a method that returns a human. That method is called birth. And I was the return value of my mother's birth. So that's the correct design. But I'm going to make it incorrect and say my father was a teacher, so I'm a teacher too. I'm giving you a bad analogy. I'm sorry, but... I just, it just makes sense if I do that. So I corrected myself before even I begin. But <clears throat> to put it in bad analogy thingy, if, I was, if my father was a class, and I am a class, and I uh, inherit everything from my father, my father used to teach mechanics. I am a teacher too. My father was a teacher. So my father taught mechanics. I am teaching computer science. So I have a teach method. My father had a teach method. But my teach overrides my father's, which means if you say, Fardad, teach, I'm going to teach computer science, although I know how to teach mechanics, which is absolute BS. I have no idea <laughs> anything about mechanics, right? So, but in theory, in object orientation, that's what it is. It's when you have a bicycle, a bicycle has a brake. So when you make a motorcycle out of a bicycle, a motorcycle has a brake. <clears throat> Is it not the same as uh, from the analogy of seeing, I'm just seeing overload, because for example, you have a plus. The plus Overloads have different signatures by definition. Overrides are identical signatures. The only the thing that distinguishes, okay. the only thing, no. Identical. It has to be identical. The act is void act. Void, and if you look at the animal, the animal has void act. Void. They are identical. If this becomes act into whatever, it's not an override anymore. It's a new method. It has nothing to do with the parents. It overloads it. 
Overload is polymorphism. Override is inheritance. So overriding is to select which one we call inheritance dictates. If you have an instance of an animal, you say act, it's going to act like an animal. If you have an instance of a cat, you say act, it's going to act like a cat, even though cat is an animal. Which means the action, the identical action of the derived class overrides the identical action of the class it inherits. Okay? This is a very critical moment. This is like the one of the most important features of object orientation that we are going through. <clears throat> Pardon me? Same definition, same signature, identical. Where in overload, there have to be a difference. They have to be different. Are we okay? All right. Now, in this example, I'm saying cat doesn't do anything special in movement. It moves exactly like an animal. I don't need to implement it, which means if I say cat move, it's going to call the parents. Move. That was moving like an animal. But if I say make a sound, it's going to say it's not going to sound like an animal. It's going to say meow because cat says meow, right? So I'm going to over override what an animal does. But cat has an additional thing that an animal doesn't have. Just coming up with stuff. Cat can play. Animals don't play. Absolute BS again. Of course they play, but just, OK? Just trying to come up. Are we OK with this? All right. So now <clears throat> if I look at the implementation of this, oh. There is another thing that I have to mention over here. Anything that is private to a base class is not accessible to its child. A child cannot access private properties of the parent. It's like, I wish it was true, but it's not. But let's say my, my father had two cars. One was a Porsche, and the other one was a Ford Festiva. Okay. It says, nobody's touching my Porsche. You can drive the Ford Festiva, OK? If that's the case, then anything that my father didn't want the children to touch falls in the private categories of the class. The thing that wants the family to use comes under a new access modifier called protected. If you put something in the protected section of the base class, it becomes only accessible to children, not outsider. My neighbor cannot come get the Ford Festiva, but I can pick up the key from the key thingy and get that car because that's the protected thing in class. In our case, the name is not accessible by the, by the cat. Cat cannot do directly anything to the, to the name. But because animal has a public accessor and modifier for the name, it is accessible not only to child, but to everyone else. So everybody can change the name of the animal, which is not right. You should be able to see and, and find out what the name of the animal is, but you shouldn't change it. Only the derived derivatives of the class should be able to do that. So, I'm going to take the one that sets the name, and I'm going to say, that's not going to be open to the public. That's going to be protected, which means now setting the name is only accessible by the children, which means the child, which is the cat, when the constructor is called, can call the name uh, modifier to set the name of the parent if wants to, if they want to okay of course there are other ways to do it but just letting you know are we okay down to this point so setting the name is a protected thing that child has but outsiders don't which means if i go to the main and i create a cat and i say cat.name try to change the cat's name it won't allow me 
going to tell me you don't have access to it. But if cat, when it's constructed, wants to change the name of the, uh, the, the, the animal, it can. So, <laughs> that was interesting. If what you're saying is logical, which means it could be completely illogical. But, <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. go ahead. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. Because constructor is what you build an object with. You cannot, we're going to learn soon that we actually have private and protected constructors too. But it's, we'll, we'll come to it soon. But I can answer your question, but it's going to put unnecessary information in people's brain. So constructors, not destructors, constructors can be private. I'll explain later why and when. But in now, for, at, at our case, let's, yes. Of course they can. They can overwrite. They can overwrite. They can overwrite. There's no problem. Overwriting they can do. You, can, you, can, you, cannot, you cannot overwrite a private one. You can, if you overwrite a private one, you cannot use the private one. You can create one that makes that thing accessible, but it just doesn't make sense. Okay, so if something is private, it remains private. <clears throat> so now I am in cat. Let's see how the cat is implemented, actually. So <clears throat> remember initialization area? Remember the initialization area in the constructor? That's where you can actually ask the operating system to use which constructor of the parent to create it. So I'm going to say create a cat by default. If I don't mention the name, name the parent Garfield. OK? Set the nine, number of lives to nine. So the properties and the base class both are initializable, if that's the word, in the initialization area. So that, so you can set the base to whatever I want, whatever you want. Obviously, instead of this, I could have done this. The result will be the same, but what's the difference? Now, what is the difference between the two? What is the difference between what I did now? And let me see if I had it here somewhere. Now, let me remove these things completely. So. So this is what I had before. This is what I have now. What I'm saying is that <clears throat> I cannot have both. You know that, right? So what is the difference if between writing the constructor like this or like that? The difference is that in the second one, you are initializing the base part with the name. In the first one, the first, the base class must have a default constructor to be built as default. Then the name changed to Garfield. First it has to come to being, then you are ch changing the name. In the second one, you are saying build an animal using the name Garfield, which means the animal doesn't need to have a default constructor. 
Okay? So in this case, let me just, <clears throat> let me see if animal has a default constructor. Uh, I have, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change it like this and add a default constructor just to show you what the difference is. So in here, I'm going to say, whoa. Set the name to Garfield. So now, and in here, I, I, I was, I did this on purpose. I used this in here. So I'm putting the name of the variable name. And because the name of the argument is identical to the method I have, I have to use this name to actually uh, set it. That's a very bad practice, extremely bad practice. Uh, it's an example of how we can write the code badly. The reason is that now you can see these things and it makes sense, but when the code gets bigger, sometimes you have two functions with the same name that causes trouble. And without you knowing, you use the wrong one because you forgot to put this and then the the compiler won't give you an error. And so using this is not a good thing to do. If I would write this code, I would actually write over here the name. So I can remove the this over here. And call it in a non-confusing way. So I put a name or something over here that doesn't have a conflict to make sure that only with this I am not distinguishing between the two because that causes lots of trouble. So I fixed that. Anyways, so now I have a default constructor and I have a one argument constructor. Let's walk through. And in here I'm going to say uh, if debug. I'm going to say defaulting an animal to, oh, uh, what did I say? Uh, not Garfield. Let's call it no name to a no name animal, or to an animal with no name. Defaulting animal to, oh, God, my English sucks to an animal with no name. OK, just to, sh to print the message uh, so we can see what's happening in here, OK? So <laughs> defaulting to an animal with no name. There is no animal needed, OK? So that's that. So now let's run it in two different ways and see what happens. First, I'm going to come over here and comment this one. So now I have the constructor that requests animal to be created using a one argument constructor. Now, when I come to my main, Uh, I have a default, so I have two different ones, and we can see exactly what happens, right? So I'm going to uh, start it. The, the first one is uh, coming with a two-argument constructor. So when the program is running, it, oh, I should have set this one. It is, so it's good. Okay, so it comes in. Now, it, it asks the cat to get created with two-argument constructor. So it comes to the two-argument constructor. But in this one, it says, I want the name to be passed to the animal's one argument constructor. And the name, so the name over here will be Fluffy. So it goes to the constructor of the animal and builds the animal with Fluffy. Right? So the animal is built with Fluffy, and it's going to say, creating Fluffy the animal. 
then it comes out, sets the no uh, initializes the number of lives to nine, so uh, to five, so n it has five, and it's going to say, creating Fluffy the animal as a cat with five lives. Right? And that's what we have created. When we go out, this is what happened at line nine. It created Fluffy the animal as a cat with five lives. Are we okay with this? Let's, uh, I'm going to go through it step by step, and then we talk. So, there you go. Cat, you were saying. Constructed, which means the name over here, so let me just, it means the name over here is Fluffy. And the number of lives is five. Okay. Passes it to the animal constructor. So the name passed to animal constructor, first let it initialize, is Fluffy. Yes. Does an animal have number of lives? Does an animal have number of lives? Did it, did it, when it was writing the constructor of animal, did you see any arguments containing number of lives in there? Why you're asking that question then? The, no magic happens. What you see is what you get. Don't think half back. If I call this, it's got. Don't. Again, when you walk through, when you walk through a code, turn off the intelligence and just follow the code to see how it's happening and learn from it. If you turn on your intelligence, then you're going to predict things absolutely in the wrong way. Okay? Um, did, you follow what I'm saying? All right. No, please keep doing that and, and keep me on my toes. I'm not saying that don't ask the question. Ask the question, but I'm telling you how you do it. To walk through this one more time, turning the intelligence to off, this is what happens. So I come over here. The cat is called with a two-argument constructor. So the two-argument constructor of cat is called with the name and number of lives. Number of... Name is passed to animal, which means animal will only get created using the name. And that's the step. And when we go through it, we'll see that the name is passed to the animal and it's fluffy. Then it sets the name using the name mutator, the name uh, uh, modifier, right? Mutator? Mutator, yeah. Modifier, right? And yes. Because cat is an animal. An animal has a name. A question. BMW is a car, right? When you get a BMW sedan, are you going to ask them to put four seats in it? Why? Because that's the meaning of a sedan. When you say BMW sedan, it inherits, inherits a vehicle with four seats. You don't need to mention it. It is a four-seater vehicle. Is a, correct? You are saying why you are passing the name to the animal. Because a cat is an animal. It needs to build all its features to be a cat. A cat, before being a cat, is an animal. Every detail of the animal must get created for a cat to be able to exist. Which means, to have a cat, first I have to have an animal with a name. After it's done, now I add the cat features that is number of lives. That was a beautiful question. Are we good? Do we understand this? Okay. So now, animal is created by the name, so it's going to say creating Fluffy the animal. Now that the animal is built, the constructor of cat can continue building the cat over the animal. And that's when the number of lives becomes uh, five, because that's what we asked for. And we're going to say creating Fluffy the animal as a cat with five lives. Are we okay with this? 
and we get out. Now, the no argument constructor of cat is called. The no argument constructor of cat is called. So I'll go in here and see what's going to happen. In here, in the no argument of constructor of cat, I'm saying create the animal with the name Garfield. So the animal gets created with the name Garfield right from the beginning. So it's going to say, creating Garfield the animal, right? And then it comes out, sets the number of lives to nine, and it's going to say, as defaulted cat with nine lives. OK? Now, let's go back. Now I'm going to change back the the cat, instead of initializing the animal to the Garfield thingy, I'm going to do what everybody says there is no problem to do, which means why initialize? I can just call uh, uh, the name to Garfield and set the name to Garfield. What's going to be the difference? Let's see what the difference is now. So for the first part, everything is beautiful. Oh, So for the first part, everything is beautiful, everything's good. We know that Fluffy the animal is getting created with five lives. Now I am defaulting, I am defaulting uh, uh, the, the cat to G. Now in here, it's going to call the default constructor of cat, but I did not mention how to create the parent. For a cat to exist, I have to have a fully built animal and then cat the build over it. Cat the, build the cat over it, correct? For that, because I didn't mention how, it has to see how it can create the cat. You didn't tell me how. When you don't tell how, what is going to get called? The default constructor. So it goes to the default constructor. First, it's going to create a cat with no name. Then it's going to come in and set the cat's name, overwrite that no name we're Garf with Garfield. Then it's going to come down, and it's going to say, as a cat with nine lives. OK, why am I not saying nine lives? With nine lives. And as you see, the message is vague now. I'm saying defaulting an animal with no name as defaulted cat with nine lives. So what happened with the Garfield thingy? It did happen. It is Garfield. If I actually, if I actually come back over here, if I actually bring my mouse on the G over here, you will see that it is nine lives, and the animal part has Garfield in it but it doesn't say it. Now, to actually make it more understandable, this is what I'm going to do. In my name, name of the animal, when it's actually being set, I'm going to say if debug Overwriting the um, name uh, with name. Why is it giving me an error? Oh, value, value, not name, value. OK, so if I run it one more time, if I run it one more time, this is what happens. In this case now, that is created. But in here, when you do it, 
it's going to say overriding. So the first one, the blank thing with no name, defaulting the animal with no name, now overriding no name with Garfield as defaulted cat with nine lives. So as you see, lots of extra stuff is happening. We don't want that. We like initialization because initialization essentially, initialization essentially builds stuff with values in it so we don't have uh, uh, an overload of action happening. I don't have to create an overload override. I'm just going to create it with those values. Therefore, it is always preferred. It is always preferred. Uh, to, yeah, it is always preferred to do initialization. Where did I put that? Anyways, uh, in here, I have nine lives. Where I put lives? Where did I put? Oh, that's in cat. So what I was saying was not to do this, please, and try to try to initialize the base class if possible. So if you see it's not possible, you can default it. Maybe the, the base class doesn't have a one argument constructor at all. You have to default it. Nobody knows. If you can initialize the parent so you don't have all these garbage stuff happening over and over. So now if I actually run the program, I'm not going to have that trouble anymore. And it's going to just uh, uh, creating Garfield and the animal as a default cat with nine lives. And I, again, didn't put the lives after. Are we OK with this? All right. Now, um, I don't even know why we have this over here. Let me remove it. Now I can say Garfield act. It's got to act playful as Garfield. Why? Because the cat knows how to act knows how to make a sound, but the movement of cat is not overwritten. So when I come over here in the main, as you see, it acts. It can move like an animal. Nothing special is happening, so it's calling the parent. It makes a sound like an animal, but it says meow after. And it plays as a cat. So now, running through this one more time in detail, this is what happens. When act is happening, because we have an override for the act, it goes to the cat's act. So it acts like a cat. The same thing happens with the c.act. It acts like a cat. When I say move, because cat does not have a move, it goes to the parents, that is animal's movement, so it acts like, moves like an animal. And then sound over here calls the sound of the animal first. It says, I want to improve the animal's sound. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say animal sound to be called. Not to have any confusion between the two because it's inheritance and the uh, signature of the two functions are identical, I use the name of the class with the scope resolution like uh, namespaces. I'm saying animal sound. First call my parent sound, then add these feature to it. So, and if I don't do that, it means I'm completely overriding it like act. In act, I say I want to abandon my parent's act and do exactly what I want. In here, I'm saying I want to keep the sound of my parent by add, but add this feature to it. So you can improve the features of your parent. And that's the thing. And play has nothing to do with the animal. Yes? So what I hear you say is if the sound doesn't have um, functions, mm -hmm. it's automatically called the Of course, yeah. That's why we call it override. 
If you overwrite it, it overwrites. If you don't, of course, the old version calls. This call. It's just about using the same one. Yes. Identical signature. Let's make it right. It has to have identical signature. Overwriting, actually, I'm going to put it in a quiz. Overwriting means having the identical method in the derived class. If that's the case, but if I just telling you something over here, if I have an animal over here, what should I call it? If I have an animal, okay, Coco, okay, now in here, I can do whatever I wanted to do with, with uh, whatever an animal can do, act, move, abort, no. Let me put this thing over here, it's irritating, there you go, and do it like that, arrow, okay. So I can go uh, dot uh, sound, but you can, Obviously, it is very naive to think that there is a play. Ride. Override. Override. Yeah. Okay? So that's that. So, you, so because a child has something, it doesn't mean the parent is aware of it. It's impossible. Which brings, us back, which brings us to the next thing. That is, so if I run this, obviously you will see that uh, those things are, but, but uh, it's, uh, Coco is going to act like an animal, move like an animal, and everything. Um, and remember, when destructors are called, they're always in reverse. Because that a cat is built on an animal, when the destructors are called first, the cat is removed, then the animal. Always. Okay? Yes, exactly. From the most derived one. Are we okay down to this point? That's the gist of inheritance. That's the, the, the whole thing about inheritance without the complexities that, is, that are about to come. Okay? So the syntax is this. You create, you can create a class out of another class. You can choose when building the derived class, how to build the base class, you can invoke, ask for invocation of different constructors of the base class inside the initialization area, decide how you want to build the thing. Anything you override will override all the class's properties. And if you don't override, it remembers what it had before. It's going to use the the old version, not the new version. But the new version is always called. It all, always overrides the thing, unless you cast the, the cat to an animal. If you cast the cat to an animal, then it all calls all the animal stuff, obviously. You can downcast everything. It's very fine. I can, I can say I'm a monkey, because if, or Neanderthal, or something, if I believe in evolution. So what did I just say? Um, <laughs> You don't believe it, it's science. But, but, but what I'm saying is that uh, I'm a Neanderthal. Like, I come from there. That's my inheritance. Or I'm a mammal, OK? That's something that I am, OK? Now, if, if you remove me and take me back to just the mammal, then the ability to speak will go away. Because mammals can't speak until they become human beings, right? They can make a sound, but they cannot speak. Are we okay with this? Do we understand this? So that's the case. So when you cast a derived class to its base, it loses all its capabilities, all its enhancements, all its over uh, functions that override the, uh, the, the old function. Just for that section of every element, uh, what I mean for the class. If I do, let's put it like this. So I'm going to call over, I'm going to say animal reference G A G, and I'm going to set it to G. I can do that. You sometimes, people call me Mr. Soleiman Lu. You can call me by my family name. 
you can always call a cat an animal. But if you do that, it forgets everything. This is g.act. This is ag.act. When I actually call this, the first one, they are both G. We know that. One is reference of the other. This one acts playfully like cat, call feed the cat. The other one just acts like an animal. If you refer to a, to a cat as an animal, it becomes an animal. It forgets that it's a cat. That's what the nature of casting is. Unless, I'm going to go through. That's the complexities that I was talking about. So in a regular type of inheritance, in the basic syntax of inheritance, when you go back from the derived to its base, it forgets all the derived capabilities. OK? And that brings us to the break. Let's go for a break and come back and we'll continue. So now, let's see what happens when we listen to the class and see what the prof is saying. OK. <laughs> All right. So, so let's take a look at it. Now, I have a cat, Pepper. I have an animal pointer that a new cat is created to it because cat is an animal. So I'm dynamically creating a cat in an animal. Now, I have an animal reference becoming a new name for cat, the Pepper. And I have a regular animal symbol. OK? Are we OK with this? Are we OK? So the structure is the same. We have all the good stuff that we have over there. In here, in this version of the thing, when you're looking at an animal, where is my animal? Oh. Is this the one? OK? So my animal is overriding act, move, and sound, and everything. So everything is overridden over here. And, uh, and, 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 yeah. So when I walk through this, this is what happens. <clears throat> so as you see, it creates the uh, cat, the pepper. <laughs> <laughs> Pepper the cat, and it uh, creates Tom the cat. So we have Tom and we have cat. Pepper, but remember, Pepper has a cat handle. Tom only has an animal handle. It means it's kind of a waste because you created a cat, but the only access you have to it is an animal pointer. And the funny thing is that you cannot upcast an animal to a cat. It's impossible. You can downcast. The reason is that an animal can be base of a cat and a dog and a, I don't know, a bat and many different types of animals. You cannot upcast because it doesn't know which one is going to. You can always downcast. It's like you're climbing a tree. When you're climbing a tree, you have so many branches that you can go on. You cannot decide which one to go to. But when you are on a branch to go down, you don't need to make a decision. You simply come to a thicker one until you get to the trunk and you get down. The path is obvious. You follow that? To climb a tree, you have so many different choices. Which branch you want to climb? If you cannot make your mind, you cannot go there. And that's for compiler. Compiler doesn't know which branch you want to go in. When you want to come down, you always have only one path. It is impossible from a branch to try to come down and you have two different paths. It is impossible. You have to always come to a thicker, to a thicker and a trunk and then come down. Are we good? All right. So, and the other one is just an animal. So, 
when I'm using a cat and a cat handle, everything is nice. I have a cat, moves like a cat, says meow, and everything is good. When I'm using the exact same cat using animal, it completely forgets it was an animal. It becomes all, it completely forgets it was a cat. All the cat stuff, playful, act like a cat, everything is gone, uh, and meow, it just becomes an animal because now I am referring to it as an animal. To make the matters worse, the one that I created Tom the cat in is completely not usable. I don't know why I created the cat, because it's an animal. It can't do anything a cat does because it doesn't even have a handle for a cat. It's just an animal pointer. All right? To make the matters worse, this is what it is. When I delete that dynamic thing that you see, it's animal pointer, right? When I delete that, it removes Tom the animal, which means the destructor of cat is not even called. That's memory leak. Because you are deleting the animal part and the cat part remains in memory. You had no access to the animal at all. The rest of it are all good because they were cats created in cat and animal created in cat. So when, so when you delete that, everything is good. So as you see over here, pepper, the cat part and the animal part, they're both gone. Do we understand this? Who said no? You said no? OK, which part you don't understand? Ten or nine? Nine and ten. You, you, by definition, you can always refer to a derived class as a base, always. Otherwise, what is a point of inheritance? You follow what I'm saying? I'm saying drive a car. If you have a BMW, I don't have to tell you drive a BMW. If you have a Tesla, I don't have to tell you drive a Tesla. If you have a Ford, I don't have to tell you drive a Ford. I'm going to say drive your car because I know all cars are driven the same way. Do you understand that? The only problem is that if I told you dump your car by the definition that we covered down to this point, if you have a Ford, you can't because only the car part of the Ford you want to dump. All the extra Ford stuff of your car cannot be dumped. In reality, that's impossible. In programming, it is when you design it incorrectly. I didn't teach the good parts yet to prevent that. Okay, so you can always refer to a base to a to a derived class as a base. That's the whole point of inheritance. That's the rule of inheritance. We did something that we need to accept. But when you call a child as a parent, there is complication. With the design that I have, if you say, Mr. Soleiman, you teach, I'm going to start teaching mechanics because you use my family name. To make sure that I teach properly, you have to say, Farda teach. That's the problem with the knowledge we have down to this point. Do you understand that? And that's what I demonstrated over here. I said, not only when you refer to a cat as an animal, it forgets what it is. Even worse, when you create a cat in an animal handle, you cannot even destroy it properly because you don't have access to the cat destructor anymore. Do we understand this? Fixing it is two seconds. You can always tell to the compiler, to C++, hey, this particular method that you see, this particular method that you see, I want you to check to see if it is a new version. 
If there is, ignore the old version, call the new version. We can do that. We can actually tell to the compiler, hey, this method that I'm calling, check to see if there is a new one. What does it mean, a new one? It means when I'm telling animal act, check to see if there is a cat part attached to it. If there is, ignore this one, call the cat one. I can tell to the destructor, hey, compiler, when you are destroying, check to see if there is a newer destructor. If there is, just call that one, which means I'm saying destroy the cat, destroy the animal. It sees, oh, there is a cat destructor. It destroys the cat. And because cat has animal in the belly, everything's going to get destroyed properly. That's just one keyword that you add to these methods. That keyword is called virtual. If I, in here, say virtual, it means look to see if there is a new one, newer one. So you see that? Take a look at here. In here, it just removes Tom the animal, and cat part is not deleted. You see that? So it only says remove Tom the animal, not Tom the cat. I made the destructor virtual. You see that? Now if I rerun the program, stop and rerun the program, you see that removing Tom the cat, removing Tom the animal. They're both gone. It deletes the last one. Does it mean anything when, I, um, when, when Simba is being removed? When Simba is removed, what is Simba? Simba is just an animal. There is no cat. When I say delete Simba, remove Simba, it looks at the destructor. Is there a new one? No, it's just an animal. There is nothing after. So animal dies properly. And I can do that with any function. Destructor is the most important one because of that from this moment, if you don't want to lose mark, that's the threat, but reality. From this moment till the moment you die, when you create a destructor, you make it virtual. To guarantee if somebody inherits something from this class, there is no memory leak. So the signature of virtual, the signature of destructor from this moment is changed. It's not only tilde, the name of the class. You are writing virtual tilde, name of the class. No matter what I ask you. Yes, it will automatically detect if it's a new one or not. That's why we put it. There is no harm of making a destructor virtual because it is impossible for you to guarantee that your object will be inherited to something new or not. You must make your destructor Always virtual. Pardon me? That's the next thing I want to say. Virtuality is transitive. What is the meaning of transitive? It means it's infectious. It transfers from one to another. If one base method or could this, let me just, uh, let me just go to the next one. So, when you make something virtual, okay, when you make something virtual, any descendants of that method, you mention or not, they become virtual, even if you don't say it. So, if I create a cat out of the animal and it's making a sound, if I make a lion out of a cat, the sound of lion will still be virtual. The sound of cat will be still virtual, even if I don't mention it. Which means all if the all the descendants, it's a transitive thing. The first thing becomes virtual, everything becomes virtual right to the end. It doesn't matter. Which means if you create a lion, refer the lion as an animal, it will still roar. 
if you refer to it as a cat, it will still roll. Always the latest version is called. Now, a tip for an interview and for the quizzes. When you are going for an interview, they ask you, what is virtual? This is the textbook answer. Virtuality guarantees that the latest version of a method is called in the hierarchy of inheritance. Virtuality guarantees, in short form, virtuality guarantees that the latest version of the method is called. Okay? But if you say hierarchy of inheritance, it means I know more. <laughs> okay? But that's the thing. Virtuality guarantees that the latest version of the method is called. Now, in here, I made the act virtual. I make the move non-virtual. It's not upgradable, which means if you create a cat out of animal, the move will not be upgradable. If you have a cat and you refer to a cat as a move, uh, to move using the animal's pointer or reference, it will forget how to move. It's not upgraded. Obviously, obviously, there is something we need to know about virtuality. That is, <clears throat> if you re refer to me as Fardad, I don't need to have a virtual teaching method. If you always refer to me as Fardad, I'm going to teach computer science. Virtuality only comes to play if you call me Mr. Soliman. Virtuality all only becomes activated when you refer to a derived class using its base handle. So if you have a derived class and you refer to it as a base handle, that's when you should look for virtuality. If you create a class using its own handle, you don't care if it's virtual or not. Everything is updated. There is no question about it. There is no problem with that. That's nature of inheritance. But if you have a derived class and you point or refer to that class using a base pointer or reference, that's when you should look. Is it virtual or not? OK? Which is our case now. Now, The destructor is virtual, sound is virtual, act is virtual, move it's not, is not. Now if I actually go my, to my main in here and call different functions of the, I created an animal, a cat, cat pointer pointing to a cat, animal pointer pointing to a cat, and everything. All the mishmash of the things that I could put over here, I did. So when it's actually run, Am I in the right version? Yes, I think I am. So all these things are set, OK? Oh, it is actually, is it? OK. Uh, class is 950 or 945? Bye-bye. <laughs> we'll talk about these later. <laughs> 